Comrades and friends to the launch of Systems Crash, an activist's guide to making revolution. Uh, the new book has been written by Neil Faulkner, Simon Hanna, and five, sorry, three other comrades, um, and has already been on sale in Houseman's Bookshop. So I haven't read it myself, but I'm looking forward to do that. Uh, so firstly, we're going to have Neil and Simon talking about different aspects of the book. Uh, Neil is going to talk about the crisis, the global crisis, and he's going to speak for about 15 minutes. And then Simon is talking about the other aspect, which is resistance and where we go. So Neil, over to you and 15 minutes or however long you need to speak, but try to keep it to 15 if possible. Thank you very much, uh, Judy. And um, Simon and I are going to uh, double act and I'm going to do the pessimistic bit and he's going to do the optimistic bit. Um, the pessimistic bit is to talk about the nature of the uh, crisis um, and so, so don't be too downhearted at the end of 15 minutes because Simon is then going to lift everything up by talking about the resistance. Um, but it is worth saying right at the outset that the reason why we've written the book is because we are of the view that there is no way out of the world capitalist crisis that we are now in other than revolution. And by revolution, we mean, of course, mass working class revolution from below, a revolution of working people and the oppressed uh, the world over, which on the face of it appears like a very, very tall order indeed. Um, but in actual fact, if you look at the scale of the capitalist uh, crisis, which is now unfolding, it's very, very difficult to imagine any kind of solutions uh, to the uh, crisis emerging within the framework provided by the system. And one of the things I'm going to say a little bit about in just a moment is why the system has this, uh, this, this character. But before I get to the economics um, of the crisis uh, narrowly defined, um, let me just uh, talk a little bit about its two most obvious effects, um, an ecological effect and um, a social effect. I'm going to talk about both of those first and then root it really in some understanding of what is happening to the system, this system that has governed our lives really for about 200 years now. Um, let me start with the with the ecological crisis. I, I think the term um, that best describes what is now happening is a dual metabolic uh, rupture. That is a rupture between human society um, on the one hand, organized by capitalism at the moment, and uh, nature and the planet, the, the ecosystems on which we are all dependent. And I say a dual metabolic uh, rupture. Metabolism, of course, is just to do really with the relationship between human beings and uh, nature. It's, it's the natural metabolism that we're talking about um, here. It's become a dual metabolic uh, rupture, or it's become apparent that that is the case in the last uh, year or so of the COVID pandemic. We're all familiar with the unfolding climate uh, crisis because we've had a sense of that as a growing crisis for about a quarter of a century now. Although, of course, the speed with which the consequences of, cli of, of uh, climate change are unfolding has accelerated. But what's now clear is that, is that in addition to the problem of exponential growth, which is hardwired into the way, the way in which the system works, exponential growth leading to levels of general pollution, which are destroying our ecosystems, but particularly carbon pollution that is giving rise to global warming. In addition to that, we now have another kind of metabolic uh, rupture, which is potentially just as serious for human life on the planet, for human civilization. Because what is happening is that global agribusiness is eating in to remaining natural wildernesses, breaking down natural fire breaks, and creating vast monoculture agribusiness complexes 
huge great breeding complexes, which uh, is enabling the transmission from animal to animal, from wild animal to domesticated animal, of new pathogens, new diseases, and the global mega slums that exist cheek by jowl with these agribusiness complexes then become the mechanism for transmission from animal to human. And then global supply chains become the mechanism for transmission from human uh, to human. And we now have one of these deadly diseases effectively embedded um, in human uh, society. And of course, continuing to evolve, continuing to mutate. And every expert um, who talks about this says it is only a matter of time, never mind the variants of COVID-19, it's only a matter of time before the next pandemic uh, comes uh, along and the next pandemic might be even worse. We have a situation where the system is destroying the ecological balance of the planet and specifically the ecological balance between human beings and human civilization on the one hand and what the planet's um, ecosystems can um, accommodate um, on the other. A dual metabolic uh, rupture which is driving us into um, an abyss. But that's not the only thing that it's doing. The second thing is a social crisis which is equally unprecedented in the history of the system because it really is the case that levels of global inequality have never been as great in the whole of human history. We are witness to a situation where human society on a global scale is being torn apart by massive levels of inequality and great accumulations of the most desperate poverty um, and stagnation at the base of uh, society. In the book, we talk about how one can think of the international uh, working class now. And of course, the, the, the international working class is an it, it's exactly that. It, it's pretty well the whole of humanity now is part of the working class. The traditional peasantry has largely disappeared um, as a separate um, class. I mean, virtually everybody is incorporated into the international working class who's not either part of the uh, super rich elite or part of the middle class. So we're talking about 80% of the world's population in some sense could be described as working class. It can be thought of as divided into three roughly equal segments. Um, a segment of relatively well paid, relatively securely employed um, traditional workers on the one hand, another huge mass of people who are precarious and another huge mass of people who are effectively surplus. I mean, surplus in the sense that they're not actually employed within the capitalist system at all, and they're eking out some kind of living on the margins of the system. And of course, millions of these people displaced now by their poverty and also by climate change and also by war and on the move. So we have an estimated billion people altogether who are displaced, either internally displaced or displaced from their um, country of origin because of the turmoil um, into which people's lives are being thrown. Let me just quote just, I mean, one statistic to give an indication of this, because it goes on and on and on. In the year that the pandemic has lasted, the world's billionaires, and there are now approximately 2,750 billionaires in the world, their wealth has increased from approximately $8 trillion to approximately $13 trillion, a massive increase in the wealth of the super rich during the pandemic, as the world economy takes a massive hit, as huge numbers of people are driven into poverty as a result of that. I mean, in the same year, the year of the pandemic, an additional 150 million people globally became extremely poor, suffering from extreme poverty as it is defined by the United Nations. So this, this, this grotesque stretching of the social divide is, is, a, is an ongoing um, process. And what that's creating is huge pools 
of poverty, of discontent, of homelessness, of unemployment, and so on at the base um, of the, uh, the system. So the system is becoming unsustainable ecologi ecologically and also unsustainable socially. Now, why is the system so dysfunctional, so parasitic um, in its effects? Well, there is a long term crisis for capitalism of over production, over accumulation and under consumption. This is the basic contradiction of the system. Basic contradiction of the system is they are squeezing wages all the time in the workplaces. They are wanting to cut expenditure on social welfare all the time. They're wanting to, in that way, accumulate uh, profit in competition with each other. And that means you've got a, a built in crisis really in the whole development of capitalism where um, they, the, the amount of surplus capital that is being accumulated is so much greater than the consumption power of the mass of the population whose wages and benefits and pensions and so on are being uh, squeezed. And it's that contradiction between over accumulation of capital, I mean, a system awash with great mountains of surplus capital seeking uh, an opportunity to invest and the underconsumption of the mass of the population that gives rise to all of these bizarre characteristics that neoliberal capitalism has, that it's based on debt, it's based on the endless creation of fictitious capital and mountains of uh, speculation. It's a, you know, a, a boom bubble and bust financialized economy. It's, and this is capital searching for an investment outlet, which when there isn't a market for productive investment, it, it explains the waves of privatization, uh, which have gone right across the globe. I mean, this is, the, this is the pattern for the last 40 years right across the globe, is that capital um, is, is enabled to buy up state assets. Um, uh, public spending is outsourced. So all kinds of new profit opportunities are being created for capital through privatization and outsourcing. Why is it operating in this way? Why is it preying upon uh, social goods? And it's doing that because it lacks um, alternative outlets for investment. The huge militarization, not just the most obvious forms of militarization, but huge increases in expenditure um, on the police, on prisons, on surveillance, on security, and so on. That's a huge proportion of uh, the world capitalist market. It's all waste expenditure. It's all completely pointless in terms of human need. It doesn't meet any human need um, at all. It meets their needs, but not um, our needs. That's another huge source um, of, uh, of enrichment uh, for capital. So you've got all of these parasitic Effect, effectively ways of, of accumulating capital because of the underlying crisis um, of over accumulation and under consumption. So we've got a system which is um, in a state of more or less permanent, slow growth, stagnation, uh, slump, generating these uh, forms of economic uh, activity which are, are parasitic and which are destabilizing you've got a world which is increasingly being torn apart ecologically and a world which is increasingly being torn apart socially. Because of all of that, the system has a crisis of legitimacy. And when the system has a crisis of legitimacy, it needs to find new ways of building a base of support for itself and it needs to enhance its repressive capacity. And both of those things are happening. And, and we use the terms creeping fascism to describe the shift to the right, um, towards nationalism and racism and uh, misogyny and authoritarianism and homophobia and transphobia and so on. The shift to the, uh, to the right as they, they, the political class that represents 
neoliberal capitalism as they try and build an ideological base for themselves, an electoral base, a mass base of support uh, for themselves. That, that's the explanation of the shift towards what we call creeping fascism. But at the same time, what they're doing, of course, is they are militarizing the police and they are cracking down on dissent. We've got, you know, the, the, uh, the, the kill the bill protests at the moment are a res in Britain, our response, of course, to the development of a police state, which is the direction of travel, not just in Britain, but of course on a um, global scale with ex you know, extreme forms of it represented by places like um, uh, China, uh, to some degree, uh, places like Russia and uh, Turkey. Um, but that's the direction in which all of us are moving because the system has this crisis of legitimacy. It's giving rise to increasing levels of discontent. And that discontent has to be uh, smashed physically by a repressive state apparatus if it gets out of control. But what they're also trying to do at the same time is to divide working people um, against themselves by peddling uh, the ideology, really, um, of, the, uh, of the 1930s. So we have, in addition to the ecological crisis uh, and the social crisis, and the underlying economic problems of an essentially stagnant system, dealing with a problem of overaccumulation and underconsumption on top of that. And because of all of that, we have a political crisis which takes the form on the right of creeping fascism and the development of a police state. And do they have any solutions to any of the basic problems? No, they don't. And because they don't have any solutions, that is why they are resorting to the ideology of the 1930s. That is why they are militarizing the police. That is why they're tooling up to crack down on uh, protest. But right across the world, they are facing massive levels of resistance from below. And that resistance from below is what has to give us hope that there is an alternative and that to talk about a revolutionary solution to the crisis of capitalism, world capitalism in the early 21st century is the most realistic kind of politics there is. And my comrade and colleague, Simon Hanna, is going to talk more about that. Thank you, Neil. Uh, yeah, that was a very... Um... Hey, carry on, Simon. Thanks, Judy. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Neil, for that uh, for that introduction, and uh, I think it really sets the scene for um, what's been going on recently um, around the world, as well as the battles that we will see. Um, well, they're already happening, but these uh, antagonisms and tendencies will only deepen. Um, I just wanted to talk about start off with kind of the three sites of struggle and resistance. And I'm going to talk about the three levels of response um, and the three sites kind of following on from what Neil was saying um, around the antagonisms that we see in the world today um, and the inevitable uh, responses, the reactions, the rebellions uh, to those antagonisms. Um, and that is, as Neil said, uh, the kind of crisis of neoliberalism, which in some countries has seen um, especially younger people facing declining living standards. And I think this is one of the key things, which is the post-war capitalism, the kind of social democratic model was sold to us on the basis that uh, your lives would be better and your children's lives would be even better than your own. That is no longer the case now. Um, and you can see so many of these social movements that are emerging, um, lots of young people protesting, lots of young people active, um, you know, out building these, you know, increasingly radical social movements. Um, and partly that is driven by the fact that capitalism, certainly in many Western countries, is, 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 is simply not providing, you know, the basics. Um, and uh, young people are increasingly finding their lived experiences much more difficult, much more stressful and difficult. Um, so I think that's the sort of 
one of the key sites of struggle, which is also producing and deepening the other fights around social oppressions that we can see around, you know, the women's movements, the black movements and so on. Um, so I think that aspect of the kind of contradictions of later stage globalization and neoliberalism, um, certainly in countries like Britain, the United States is very important, but also on a global scale. I mean, we have to see the fact that, you know, the kind of post-Soviet era um, after 1991, when kind of neoliberalism really went into overdrive as a um, as a dominant um, capitalist hegemonic model, um, or has also seen um, you know the rise of new powers like China, um, um, Brazil, India, indeed the kind of old concepts that we we that we were using of the global north and the global south. Um, really have to be re-examined now because you know it seems strange to include China and India, for instance, within you know, the previous concept of the 80s and 90s, whenever um, whenever the anti-capitalist movement talked about the global south. So the shifting economic productive capacities where a lot of industries and businesses obviously have moved their production towards other countries because they want to exploit, um, as they see it, cheaper labour, but it has developed productive forces in a number of countries. Uh, and so the realignment of global politics and the realignment of the kind of traditional post-war power structure between nations um, is also going to be another site of struggle. I mean, we can already see the trade wars between China and um, the United States um, as one example, but obviously increasingly what happens in countries like Brazil, in terms of Brazil's politics, um, has an impact globally. It is you know, increasingly seen as a country where you know, the struggles against people like Bolsonaro will you know, be felt and seen in other parts around the world. So that is also another site of struggle um, that we can uh, that we can already see developing. Um, so alongside the changes of the world around neoliberalism, the environmental crisis. Um, don't need to obviously go into that kind of too much at this point. Neil's already uh, outlined how he thinks uh, it's going to um, impact on politics, um, but clearly the environmental crisis is an existential crisis for uh, the planet for humanity. Um, and that's not just sort of, you know, you come to a meeting and there's a Marxist in the room who says, you know, this is the final crisis of humanity. And, you know, it's the famous thing. Marx has always predicted lots of, um, you know, crises and so on. Um, but this is just kind of going on what, you know, UN climate scientists are saying. I mean, the global warming that we are seeing around the world is going to cause an absolutely fundamental shift um, in the, uh, the planet, the environment, um, how much of it is livable on, how much food we can grow, you know, um, um, the acidity levels of the oceans, the rising water levels and so on. And we're already seeing obviously crucial battles being waged now around the environmental crisis from you know, struggles over um, uh, indigenous peoples um, in countries all around the world who are fighting against the increasing exploitation of their um, of the resources on their on their native lands through to social movements like Extinction Rebellion. Um, but this again is only going to deepen and um, uh, become a much more serious focus. I mean, obviously, we're already seeing millions of climate refugees. Um, that is also something that is going to exacerbate and become a much bigger force of kind of global politics, which will then segue with the final kind of site of struggle, which is me lots of sites of struggle. I'm just focusing on the three main ones here, which is, as Neil said, the kind of counter revolution or the sort of natural um, tendencies from politicians and kind of enraged sections of society who are not won over by left progressive politics um, to uh, um, push for a more reactionary uh, political solution to the crises that they see. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, Trump was an expression of that, Bolsonaro, um, um, from, uh, from Milan Neal's perspective, there was obviously elements around the Brexit uh, project, which was also part of this sort of the idea of kind of nationalism front and centre, trying to restore, kind of uh, make Britain great again, or, you know, kind of like a, the way of trying to reset the last few years which some people are rightly saying hasn't been great for a lot of the population, but their solution is not a radical socialist one. Their solution is, um, uh, is to try and go back to what they see as a, um, a brighter conservative 
past in the 1950s and so on. But these kind of populist kind of like um, uh, reactionary movements around the world. Um, it's not just the question of the street movements that are being built. As I said, it's also that there is increasingly so many countries now where the governments are very dangerous reactionary forces. Obviously, Modi in India is another example. Um, uh, Bolsonaro, uh, Orban in Hungary. Um, we'll see what happens in France next year with the presidential elections. But there's, you know, there's a good chance that Le Pen could win there. And although Trump has been defeated um, in the recent elections, um, you know, he's still got the second highest vote that any presidential candidate has ever got in US history. Um, and although Trump might have been beaten, the political tendencies and forces of crisis in US society that led to Trump have certainly not been reversed. And it is incredibly unlikely that a centrist liberal like Joe Biden will be able to reverse them. So who knows who the Republican candidate is going to be at the next presidential election? It might be someone as bad as Trump or worse, because he might be a more competent sort of mainstream political figure who's kind of tacking to the right. So all of these are also huge sites of struggle. And you can see kind of the battles that are being waged across the world between progressive movements and reactionary movements. And increasingly, these are very violent struggles. I mean, you know, we've already had one Labour MP murdered um, in Britain by um, a fascist um, 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 assassin. But there are, you know, countless people on the left um, or progressive movements around the world who are being targeted and murdered by um, um, people who are kind of like modern day fascists or, you know, far right nationalist um, um, violent activists. So these kind of sites of struggle, which we can already see in the world today, I mean, I'm not saying anything that probably people on the call haven't already noticed themselves, but what we're saying is these are going to make some of the most, you know, fundamental fault lines um, for the coming future and having the right politics and the kind of radical systemic critique to be able to, um, you know, challenge some of these things that are happening and also build credible radical socialist alternatives is, is, is what is going to make or break the future. So those are kind of the sites of struggle. And I just want to talk quickly about sort of the levels of struggle as well. Um, and I'm going to kind of base, base it on um, good old Frederick Engels here, which is um, Freddie Engels talked about the three levels of class struggle being the political, the industrial and the ideological. Now, obviously, there's no kind of brick wall between these things. They are all sort of interconnected um, at different levels of analysis. Um, but it's useful to think about the different ways that these struggles articulate forms of protest and resistance and what sort of kind of political agendas or ways of organizing flow from them. So I'll start with the industrial struggle. Um, now, I'm a trade unionist in Britain, which at the moment seems like a thankless task because we have one of the most um, some of the most restrictive anti-union laws in the Western world. Um, and certainly the British workers movement uh, kind of you know, it's got six million members, but it hasn't been able to launch and engage a serious um, uh, offensive political struggle for a great many years. We had the two big one day public sector general strikes um, under the uh, coalition government between 2010 and 2015. Both those one day strikes ended, um, unfortunately, in defeat. And whilst there are important battles happening from the British working class, we also have to think more kind of globally about it. You know, we can't just kind of be socialists focusing on what is going on in Britain. Um, we have to think about the militancy and confidence of the global working class. And obviously, you know, last year we had the biggest general strike in history, 250 million people in India, primarily around the farmers dispute, but there was other um, issues uh, that, you know, uh, leading to such a generalized class-wide fight back. As you can already begin to see in countries like India and China, um, you know, mass multi-million formations of working people organized into, into unions and beginning to take action. So that industrial struggle at the point of production, distribution and exchange is obviously still important because if you're talking about socialism, you are talking about a system in which the working class has political power. And of course, as we say in the book, the working class isn't just whether you work in a factory, the working class is anyone that has to sell their labor, their ability to work in order to be able to survive okay you don't own capital you don't you know run a business or anything like that you have to sell your labor power your labor time to a boss and in return you get wages and your boss exploits you and makes makes money out of you um that fault line which marx identified you know um you know 200 years ago um is still uh, is still absolutely essential to any kind of marxist socialist strategy but of course we have to factor in now the question of the social movements which are not working class specifically in the sense that they take place largely in the workplace, 
um, or around kind of, you know, the economic articulation of um, uh, capitalist reproduction, but they are largely working class because if you go on any of these protests, you know, Black Lives Matters or the women's, you know, demonstrations that have been happening in countries like Spain and so on, um, they are very working class demonstrations. Um, how could they not be? Um, because they are drawing on some of the most kind of oppressed and exploited people in society who are taking action and trying to resist that exploitation and depression. So in a situation where kind of capital has been on the offensive for the last 30 years, the industrial struggle is important. We have to be aware of the, of the, you know, the ways that capitalism tries to frustrate and break up and prevent working class struggle. And we have to be clear about why we must resist that and fight back and also find ways as much as possible of relating to the social movements, not standing kind of aloof from them, you know, or they're not radical enough or, you know, they're only focused on kind of liberal questions of rights or anything like that. You have to be involved in those protests and you have to be trying to articulate an anti-capitalist strategy within them, as well as, you know, just being in basic solidarity with the struggles that are being waged. On the political struggle, in the book, we do go through some of the political responses that the left has come up with internationally, um, which obviously, you know, people will be familiar with here from Podemos to Syriza, the PT in Brazil. There's other examples we didn't, you know, talk that much about, but Rifondazzi only communist to in Italy. Um, Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn um, in the US and in Britain. Um, and so there are political movements. There are, you know, attempts by the left sometimes successfully to win governmental power. Um, and yet a lot of these projects have ended badly for the left. And I think that's something that we need to take quite seriously because there's always a problem that whenever the left does engage in a political struggle in order to win votes, it does end up being uh, integrated into the existing power relations of the state. Um, of course, the Labour Party, for instance, has always been integrated into the existing power relations um, and has never wanted to overthrow capitalism, not seriously. But other more radical parties like Syriza and Podemos, it looked initially like they did want to do that. And yet the experience of being in government and managing a capitalist economy inevitably politically broke them or has you know, caused serious kind of political ruptures and divisions within their ranks. But we can't draw from this a kind of post-political you know, kind of semi-anarchist position of we need to change the world without taking power. The question of political power is absolutely essential. Um, it is a question of, you know, who gets what, when and how. And in a situation in which we're heading towards potentially irreversible climate change and having to survive on a planet which is two, three, four degrees warmer, um, we will need a planned economy. We will need, work, you know, much more democratic control um, over resources and how they're distributed. Um, and this can't just be done locally. It can't just be done through, you know, co-ops and, you know, and so on. It has to be um, a, 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 a political project, but it has to be obviously one that is an anti-capitalist political project because the, the electoral tactics that we've seen so far on the left either haven't worked, i.e., you know, Jeremy Corbyn didn't win the elections, um, or people have got into power, I um, mean, you know, in Greece and and, uh, and uh, Spain as well, um, and it's led to political problems for them. So I think we need to sort of, and again, I'm not going to say there's an easy answer to that, there's a major site of struggle, um, but it's something that, you know, we need to take seriously. We can't just sort of say, um, and there's a danger in Britain, you know, Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour left didn't didn't succeed. So we swing the stick the other way towards just social movements. Um, social movements get defeated. We swing the stick back towards being in the Labour Party. We need to try and find a better synthesis and a better way of trying to um, uh, uh, create a unity of struggles around a common kind of radical programme. And the final one I'll talk about very briefly is the ideological struggle. We have a fundamental problem in the sense that, um, you know, we clearly need to move past capitalism. We clearly need a, um, a much more rational, democratic, humane economic model to, 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 to manage human society globally. Um, but um, in the eyes of most people, we tried that. It was called communism in Russia and it didn't work. Um, and so you have a situation now where there's lots of people who are radical, they're even anti-capitalist, um, but their knowledge, their experience even of um, countries which apparently tried to move past capitalism um, just doesn't look very appealing. You know, sort of everyone jokes today about the bread queues in Russia and, um, and, and, and so on. So people obviously don't really think that's a very credible way forward. So we do have to be waging an ideological battle as well because there is a danger that we're constantly fighting defensive struggles. We're constantly rushing from one kind of crisis 
to the next. And sometimes we might even win an, an occasional defensive struggle, but we won't be able to win the war unless we can put forward, put forward a vision of a anti-capitalist socialist program and convince millions of people around the world that that's, you know, that that's, that's what we need to be putting in place. That's what we need to be fighting for. And obviously, Neil and myself and the organisation, we're in anti-capitalist resistance. You know, we're not saying we're the only ones doing that. Thankfully, there are other socialists out there who are also putting forward socialist politics um, and so on. But, you know, one of the things that we're trying to say is that we need to take the question of what socialism is and how to articulate it and win it as an, as an idea, as a living idea that is in the minds of millions of people um, as something seriously. And we can't do what the left used to do in a lot of you know, disputes where they'd say, this is a very bad thing. You know, we, you know, this police racism or sort of, you know, these workers losing their jobs is a bad thing. Um, we need socialism. Like it's not good enough just to have a kind of quick copy paste thing at the end of a leaflet um, about this thing called socialism. We need to try and explain what we think it might look like and how it might function. Um, and so I think this is the important thing around the, you know, like the credibility of anti-capitalist um, politics. And the final thing I'll say on, 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 the, on, the, on, the, on the ideological struggle as well, is that um, when we think about, as we've mentioned before, the growth of the global far right and the politics that they're putting forward, um, we have to be absolutely firm as a left that we reject that politics. Now, I know that might sound obvious, but it is very tempting when there are aspects of society moving to the right to sort of trail it or tack it or, you know, or sort of try and square the circle or maybe sort of maybe we do also need to sort of you know listen to people's concerns around some of these things. Um, obviously, we need to listen to the concerns of people, but what that cannot mean is that we accommodate to a political project of prejudice or bigotry um, or division. We believe from a global perspective, the working class is a universal class. We reject divisions of the working class along national lines or race or um, gender or anything like that. Um, we believe in the liberation of people from their social oppression, but we also believe that we can't really finally win unless we get rid of capitalism. And it's the working class in all of its, you know, glorious, complicated nature globally that has to do that task because there's no other social class or force in society that has yet emerged that can do it. Um, but there is a culture war going on and there is, you know, books being put out and there is arguments and articles being put out by people ostensibly on the left who are trying to promote a kind of left nationalist agenda, who are trying to say, you know, the working class is economically protectionist and socially conservative and we need to respect that and listen to it and so on. The fact is the working class is all kinds of things. You know, there is a working class that is radical and revolutionary. Um, there's a working class which, you know, sort of supports some of the politics of, you know, the British National Party, for instance. Um, so it's not just the working class per se, it is the working class organized as workers fighting for their own self-interest that is the radical important component of how we're gonna be able to change the world. And therefore the ideological struggle around being clear about the internationalism, the anti-racism, the fights against all forms of oppression within the class, including obviously gender violence and so on, um, is an absolutely crucial part of the culture war. And, you know, the left can't be of the opinion that, oh, let's just fight for wages and housing and that will kind of resolve all of these issues. It won't. Um, and we won't be able to build the kind of movements that we need to build unless we are also fighting the culture war and winning it as well. And at the moment, I think globally, unfortunately, um, well, in some cases, we're not winning it. We're actually on the back foot around these things. So that's what I kind of wanted to say, um, uh, kind of in terms of the resistance um, and how it needs to happen, the different sites of struggle, the different levels of struggle. Um, and I'd encourage you to read the book as well, in case you're uh, interested in uh, thinking more on, on any of these topics. So I'll stop there. Okay. Thanks to both speakers and thanks for keeping to time. So remember, folks, that if you want to take part in discussion, then post a question in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And I know we've now got four questions come through. Should we take them one by one? Um, and who wants to answer the first one? I'm Dave Kellaway, which says, do you agree that the collapse of the bureauc bureauc bureaucratized dictatorships in the East also provided a massive new outlet for surplus capital. 
However, is this now reaching some sort of limit? Who'd like to answer that? Should, should I come back on that? Um, yeah, okay. You see, I, I think what I would say is yes to a limited degree in relation to the Stalinist dictatorships. I think when they collapsed in Russia and Eastern Europe, obviously there were somewhat enhanced opportunities for Western-based capital to then move into uh, those markets. However, what I would say is I think it was relatively limited because those markets were already relatively clogged up by state capitalist um, operations that then become private capitalist operations so that it's still the case in the Russian economy as far as I'm aware that most of the stuff that is actually being produced and traded inside the Russian economy is still being produced um, locally. I, it's not as if that there's been a huge influx of Western capital and Western goods and so on into um, Russia. Not on the same scale, not even beginning to get close to the same scale as what's happened in the global south. And you see, I think if you really want to get a sense of how the system has changed in the last 30, 40 years in the neoliberal era, it's that huge uh, shift of capital, productive capital, from the global north to the global south and what's also happening as part of that is that there has been the creation of a mass working uh, a mass middle class um, uh, and and a better off uh, working class capable of providing a market in you know in china in india in lots of the south american newly developing uh, economies and so on and consumption it's not just about cheap production, it's also about having new markets for the stuff that the system is churning out. So I would I'd put the emphasis very much on what's happening um, in relation to the global south. And worth just saying um, as one final comment uh, on this is that one characteristic of, of the system now, and this is a growing characteristic of the system, is that ca capital has become transnationalized so that you now have gigantic corporations that don't really have a meaningful national base anymore. I mean, back in the 60s and the 70s, we would have talked all the time about British-based multinationals and American-based multinationals and so on. It's much less like that now. Of course, it is the case uh, that there are big corporations that have their headquarters in one country rather than another. But then if you look at their operations, at their global operations, they are operating in a completely transnational way, particularly in that production is relocated and typically outsourced in the global south. But the corporations, which are effectively now hollow corporations because they're not producing anything, the corporations that are creaming off most of the profit are they're hollow be precisely because they're not producing. Um, what they do is they control the market. They control the marketing network. So you look at a, uh, a big company like Apple, for example, Apple doesn't make anything. And so when you look at your computer and it's got a little Apple logo on it, it's not been made by Apple. Apple makes nothing. Everything, all the hardware and is, is actually being manu it's, it's completely outsourced and they pay very small amounts of money to the factory owners in Shenzhen or wherever it is the operation is. Virtually nothing at all to the workers who put the blinking things together, but they cream off the vast bulk of the profit because they control the entire marketing network. So, I mean, it's a long answer to a very simple question. Only to a limited degree, I think, is Western-based capital benefiting from the collapse of the wall and the opening up to a degree of the old Stalinist economies. It's what's a much more significant global trend is that shift relocation of production from the north to the south and the emergence of the hollow transnational corporation. I also say something on that, Judy. I think you're muted. Judy, you're muted.
Okay, I'll say something. Uh, what do you use? Go ahead. Sorting out the mute thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Um, just, I mean, just on the, um, yeah. I mean, the global shift around capitalism, as I said in my contribution, is absolutely, you know, decisive. Um, and, you know, I, I really do believe in many ways that China is the key to the international situation, um, maybe in the way that Germany was in the, you know, late 20s and early 30s. Um, and certainly, you know, the growth of China as a capitalist country, and I would argue also increasingly an, an imperialist uh, nation, um, is decisive and it will be decisive, you know, in, you know for the coming struggles. Um, and the existence of the Chinese working class as a huge um, social force, who, as Neil said, makes the great bulk of, I mean, I'm nearly 40 now, turning 40 this August. Um, uh, when I was growing up in the 90s, uh, if it said made in China on it, it was usually a cheap toy uh, that broke as soon as you um, um, got it out the box. Now, made in China is more often than not a hallmark of quality. And as Neil said, if you've got any Apple products, they are made in China to a very high exacting standard. Um, and there's just been um, studies that have come out now talking about how um, the average sort of um, gross national product in Chinese cities now uh, easily matches what exists in the West. Um, and that is phenomenal. That's happened in like within our lifetimes, within the last you know, 25 years or something. And, and there, will, there is already a huge argument and disagreement on the left about, uh, uh, about the nature of China. And I just want to say this, I know this isn't kind of completely about what we're talking about, but I think it's going to be very important because, um, you know, there are very powerful capitalist forces that look to China, which is a uh, authoritarian regime with zero democracy, certainly zero working class input or power, um, but is a thriving capitalist country. And there is, you know, increasingly authoritarian capitalists who think that's a pretty good model. Um, we cite in the book, um, um, uh, um, um, a recent book that just came out, Can Democracy Survive Capitalism? Um, the answer might be no. Um, Naomi Klein in her book on climate change says that, you know, there's two visions of the future when faced with runaway climate change, either a kind of socialist economy based on more workers' democracy, um, or a kind of just constant authoritarian police state um, in which what is left of capitalist society is protected by, you know, increasingly militarized and vicious um, um, violent forces. Um, and that's obviously the route, you know, that is happening in um, an increasing number of countries. So I think that's sort of the question of what China is and how it has grown and also India as well grown under globalization that doesn't mean it was great and everyone's having a lovely time and sort of workers and peasants are, are you know are loving it they're obviously not there's huge said before huge protests and strikes and resistance movements um but it is changing the face of the planet um and so getting that right and understanding that that is going to be crucial to um how we articulate left politics going forward because i don't think it's going to do us any favors if we say, oh, we're socialists, um, we want socialism like in China. Um, I don't think that's gonna win over the broad multi-million, you know, kind of alliance of people that we need to, to have. We need to be articulating a, like a vision of the future, which is more democratic, which is more free, more humane, um, more about kind of individual rights, not in a liberal sense, but like in a collective sense. But, you know, so like, I think that's an important part of the resistance and sort of, you know, some of the arguments and analysis that needs to be made. I guess it links in with uh, Leanne Gale's question, which we're going to come on to in a bit about the question of narrative, you know, sort of how, like, how do you, yeah, how do you put forward your vision of the future? Um, is it sort of, you know, yeah, anyway, I guess we can come on to that. Judy, you're muted. Judy, we can't hear you. I think <laughs> I think Judy's having trouble with her with her mic. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But look, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll just come in on um, I'll come in on another of the questions. Um, 
um, Dave, Dave Calloway's question about, um, uh, I mean, these very le various lef left reformist uh, movements which have emerged in the last sort of 10 years or so, the, the Sanders movement, the Corbyn movement, Podemos in Spain, the Bloco in uh, Portugal, Syriza in Greece, um, the movement for socialism in Bolivia, the Chavista movement in Venezuela and so on. There's been a whole series of these uh, movements which are essentially left reformist uh, movements. I mean, they imagine, I mean, they, they're they essentially semi social democratic, really. They imagine that there could be significant redistribution of wealth and a significant reining in of corporate power and a significant uh, rebuilding of welfare infrastructures and so on, broadly within the framework um, of, the, of the system. And I think, you know, if you look back to what happened in relation to the crisis, last time, that's exactly what did happen. Um, you look at what happens after the Second World War, I mean, lots of lots of socialists, lots of revolutionaries, so there's no way the system can survive this crisis. The crisis of the depression, the crisis of fascism, the crisis of the world war and the genocide, this is going to tear, this is barbarism, it's gonna tear the whole world apart. There's going to be an economic collapse as the, as the war economies unravel, after the war, you're gonna have a, a collapse into a global depression, and then there's going to be a wave of revolution. I mean, that's what, that's what Trotsky thought was going to happen at the end of the, uh, when he was talking about this at the end of the 1930s, and none of that did happen. What actually happened is that you had national development programs in what we now call the global south, what was then called the third world, that did actually mean significant improvement for ordinary people. You had a, a global boom for the system. I mean, the system grew faster between the late 1940s and the mid 1970s than any other time in its history. You had the birth of the consumer society, rising living standards. In that framework, strong trade unions were built and social democratic parties really were reformist. They carried out reforms. They did things like build the National Health Service, for example. Now, the question is, is that viable in the, what are we now in, the third decade of the 21st century? We think the answer is no. You see, we think that that was a period in the development of the system, which can be defined in terms of state capitalism, where most capital had a clearly defined national base and market, and it, and it projected um, capital from that national base, but you had a relatively coherent national base. So you could actually use government intervention to manage the economy, to um, enable the process of growth. You also had a world system, incidentally, which was underpinned by the dominance of the dollar. So it was a very stable world system. You had the systems in Eastern Europe, which were also using state power to accumulate capital, but also through the accumulation of capital in Russia and Eastern Europe and so on, what they were doing was actually enabling a rise in living standards. They might have been horrible dictatorships, but people's living standards were going up. Now, that was all happening in a framework, if you like, of a kind of national capitalism. That's not an option. I mean, the nation state is crucial to the system as a source of contracts, as therefore a source of profit. If you think about the way in which all the, everything's being outsourced and everything's being privatized and huge increases in military expenditure, this is a, a direct um, sort of inflow really of, um, of taxpayer revenues being turned into profits uh, for capitalists. The state is also crucial in crushing dissent, in controlling working uh, people. But what the state does not do in the same way is actually manage um, a national economy. What it's trying to do at best is to get these big conglomerates, these big transnational corporations to invest in one country rather than another. Capital, corporate capital, is out of control as far as the nation state is concerned. There is no kind of there's no national capitalist, there's no state capitalist type solution. Now, if that's true, then none of the left reformist projects can succeed. They're all doomed. 
and and this is you know central to our argument our argument here is we have to have a revolutionary perspective does that mean we're not interested in corbynism I'm let, I'm, i know it's dead now but let's just take that as the example um the answer is i was in the labor party and and i was in momentum when corbyn was the leader Simon, I think I've got rid I've ended my Labour Party membership, but I think Simon is still a member. And, and there are other people who are involved in anti-capitalist resistance who are revolutionary socialists who have been involved in Labour or are involved in Labour supporting that project. And that's because there are huge numbers of people pushing for change. Pushing for change is always good because you come up, we would argue, against the barriers where there's a limit to change and you learn from that experience that if you don't move towards a revolutionary understanding of what needs to be done, you're going to be defeated. So we support all progressive movements that are pushing against the limits of the system. And within those movements, we are arguing, and yes, you've reached the limit, this is the limit, the system can't deliver, we have to overthrow um, the system and, and any revolutionary who says, oh, I'm not going to have anything to do with Syriza or I'm not going to have anything to do with uh, Corbynism or I'm not going to vote for Sanders in an American election or whatever it is. Anybody who says that is just a mad sectarian because actually you have to be with the mass of working people and oppressed people who have an essentially progressive perspective and are therefore supporting these projects. That's the part that's part of the business of how you build um, a revolutionary alternative. But the crucial thing for us is we don't see any solutions to the basic problems facing the planet and humanity without a revolutionary rupture. Maybe we'll come back to that a little bit more towards, um, towards the end, because I know there are other questions that, uh, about that, that that have come up in the Q&A. OK, can we jump to the youth then, uh, Jamie Anker? is saying, can I please ask for any top tips on how to mobilize a highly individualized youth? And then we'll jump to Leanne, who's got, um, who's got two questions, and then we'll go back to Dave's questions. Should I say something on this, Judy? Sorry? Okay, well, um, I uh, exposed myself earlier as not a youth when I said I was nearly 40. Um, but I was one of the main kind of organisers of the student protests in 2010 when I was uh, when I was in university as a as a mature student. Um, and I think I mean, I think it's it's not really necessarily that difficult to get young people to attend a protest. I mean, like I said before, if you go on any of the BLM protests or, you know, if you went to the Sarah Everard vigil at Clapham Common, which, you know, myself and Neil were at. If you go to the, any of the Kill the Bill protests and, you know, we've seen the ones in Bristol and so on, um, getting young people politically active around protests. Um, yeah, I mean, people will come on like um, demonstrations. Um, the problem we have, um, I think, is that um, young people still aren't necessarily joining political organisations or being involved in institution building, by which I mean, I think that there's um, a real appetite to go out there and, you know, challenge the cops and sort of, you know, uh, get on the megaphone and block the roads, which is great. You know, that's, you know, that, that, you know like we need that kind of raw energy if we're going to get anything done. Um, but uh, when it comes to sort of, you know, actually, yeah, kind of being involved in building a sustained long term kind of campaign or kind of organisation, um, that is harder to get young people involved. And I think, I mean, partly that is probably a general decline of the labor movements. You know, I mean, in the old days, you know, you would, you know, I mean, the trade union way of organizing, setting up a committee um, can be quite conservative and ponderous sometimes, but it was also how almost every social movement's been built previously. You know, there was sort of, you know, there was people in each town and city organizing, meeting regularly, getting the leaflets out, you know, and, 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 um, um, and so on. Um, whereas sort of now, because so much of it is online and online is also quite atomized experience. You now everyone's talking to each other on Twitter and Facebook and things like that, um, or Snapchat, if you're younger, um, I'm not on Snapchat, unfortunately. Um, but you know, like whatever platform you're on, um, people are talking to each other, but that's not necessarily the same as kind of building a kind of an institutional organizational, um, 
thing which can maintain the mobilizations and maintain the protests. And we saw that with the BLM protests. Um, like, I mean, certainly the ones in Britain, they were good. They were quite big and they happened in places all across the country. Um, but they were kind of a couple of demonstrations, then they stopped. Um, they were organized by um, relatively small um, groups of activists who put out stuff on Instagram and, you know, other social media things which people then saw and went on the protest, but that was it. Um, now, what's being done with the Kill the Bill protest is different. And I think, you know, th th there's people learning lessons of coalition building. But when it comes to kind of youth, I think it is about trying to, you know, obviously have the protests and the, you know, the exciting things that young people want to come on. But I think it is also a question of having that dialogue and discussion around what does political activity mean and trying to create space in which youth can be more organised. I mean, there's obviously practical problems that young people have. You know, they've got low wages, they work on long hours, they might have precarious living existence, might have a precarious housing existence, they might sort of have all kinds of things going on in their lives which, you know, make it hard. You know, there's, there's a mental health kind of like like epidemic amongst young people around depression and anxiety and you know stress and things like that and all, all of this is caused by neoliberalism and capitalism all of this is you know all of that kind of oppressive horrible stuff accumulating in people's head that makes it so hard to kind of you know think about the future or you know kind of all you know like uh, um um and so on so definitely trying to create spaces in which um in which young people can organize and come together um, um, I mean, a youth movement, a radical socialist youth movement in Britain would be great. Um, and kind of creating the space for that to happen, I think, I think would be great. And also kind of cultural events that young people might be interested in coming to and taking part in. So yeah, like I think kind of getting people out on protests is easy, relatively easy. It's about sustaining that level of activity and being able to build something which is a more permanent not permanent forever, but sort of a more like stable institutional organizational relationship which can sustain mobilizations and also help, yeah, turn people from individuals into kind of collective organizers of, of resistance, you know. And again, there's no there's no magic way to do that. If there was, um, we'd have done it. But I think it's about having these kind of uh, insights and thoughts around it, which I think will, you know, hopefully point the way forward. Okay, thanks, Simon. Should we jump to Leanne's two, Leanne's two questions? which is firstly, how does unpaid labor fit into workers' struggle? And secondly, how can we come up with a new narrative which would engage the masses? Wow, that's a good one, isn't it? Okay, who's gonna take those two? Sorry, who's qu whose question was that um, again? Um, Judy, I didn't quite get it. Leanne Gale. Leanne uh, Gale? Yeah, and the question was, First question is, how does unpaid labour fit into workers' struggle? Yeah. And secondly, how can we come up with a new narrative that would engage the masses? Well, shall I, shall I say something about that? You see, yeah. I mean, I mean the, the whole thing about, I mean the, 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 I mean, the way I think to think about the working class is, is, to, is to see the working class as the class of people who own no property or no productive property and who have no choice but to sell their labor power, uh, labor power in order to earn a wage or a salary or they are dependent on such uh, people so there's a huge number of people who in different ways are dependent on people who are selling their labor power uh, to capital now that will include a very high very high proportion of the people that I've defined as surplus humanity. And, and those are the people I'm talking about who are not, generally speaking, actually employed directly um, by capital, but they will very often be people who have some kind of relationship with others who are, so they're perhaps getting some kind of support that way, or they will be eking out some kind of living on the margins of the system. But if they could get a job working for capital, they would be willing uh, to do that and they form in Marxist terms part of the reserve army um, of labor. And the reserve army of labor is absolutely an absolutely critical part of the working class because it's the reserve army of labor that acts as this great weight really on organized uh, workers and indeed not so organized uh, workers because it's that mass of people um, who, who don't have jobs, who want jobs, who put a kind of downward pressure on 
wages which is very very profitable for capital i mean the whole business of relocating i was talking about this earlier the whole business of relocating production from the global north to the global south has has enabled capitalists who are still operating in the global north it's one of the things that's contributed to their ability to drive down wages um you know there are there are concrete examples of where factories have been shut down in the global north in response to uh, organized trade unionism uh, because the wages are too high and then been relocated to the global south so we should i mean we should think of the working class as um as a sort of as a single uh, class defined by its need by its lack of control over means of production and its need to sell its labor power but then within it of course there are all kinds of divisions the divisions of oppression and the divisions of different uh, wage levels and different levels of uh, security um, and so on and so forth and national divisions as well uh, divisions of gender and so on all kinds of divisions now those divisions are real but they're also divisions which are deliberately fostered and deepened by the ruling class by the international ruling class because it is in their interest to do that because they need to divide people so they're constantly divide. so I mean, there is a sense, really, in which socialist politics, and this is picking up on something that Simon has said about the kind of resistance we need, there's a sense in which the essence, the very essence of practical socialist politics is that what you're trying to do is to overcome all of those divisions, not to swallow people into a uniform class identity. I mean, we celebrate diversity, we celebrate the fact that, that we are we have so many different religions and languages and ethnic identities and cultural identities and so on. We celebrate that kind of uh, diversity. That's part, part of the richness of human society. But in terms of political action, we want people to work together. We want people to fight together. And it's when people come together as a class and the oppressed, when they come together, that our side is most um, powerful. So I don't really see this. I, I, I don't think there's a useful distinction to be made between people who are uh, paid and people who are unpaid. Sorry, one last thing I will say about this. Um, one of the things that um, some of us are working on at the moment is the theory of uh, social reproduction and how we integrate the unpaid labor of mainly women, domestic uh, labor, in the creation of value and uh, surplus because there are huge inputs to capital of what is effectively the unpaid labor, unpaid domestic labor involved in social reproduction that's essential to the survival of the system. And of course, all of that is unpaid. All of that's a kind of free input um, to the system. Okay, and Leanne's second question, who would like to take that? How can we come up with a new narrative that would engage the masses? Should I say something since Neil's just spoke? We can take it in turns. Um, yeah. Um, um, well, I mean, I think that there's probably multiple narratives. You know, there's no one single um, thing that will kind of cut through and unite uh, everyone all at the same time. Um, uh, certainly not at the moment. Um, obviously, the arguments around socialism and post-capitalism and what the world should be like and how it should be organised more, you know, more rationally and, and, and humanely than it is now is a universal argument. Uh, but lots of people aren't even close to that. They're not even, you know, that's, you know, the sort of, that just seems like a, kind of a million miles away. So I think we have to think about, you know, different types of narrative. And I, I, I like, I guess that goes back to my thing around the different sites of resistance and the div different levels of resistance um, and how each one kind of articulates uh, like a particular response. So, um, uh, I mean, and this actually kind of links in with uh, Leanne's question one and two around this. For instance, one of the things that people really, really care about, um, and there's lots of polls that, you know, have kind of shown this, um, they don't, well, they don't particularly care about social inequality. And I know that sounds blunt to people on the left because we talk about social inequality a lot and obviously social inequality is very bad and it's something that we should care about. But your average person doesn't necessarily 
see the world in those terms. Um, they might say, oh, isn't it terrible? There's all these billionaires, you know, and so on. But that's not the driving kind of perspective of, of, of the way they see the things. Um, what, what most people care about, and increasingly so, in a late stage globalized neoliberal world, which is teetering on the brink of, you know, runaway climate change, is the question of security. The question of, you know, the basics in their life, the questions of like, you know, um, and I don't mean security as in police, I mean security as in, as in, yeah, sort of, you know, their living arrangements, their sort of future, their sort of, you know, like, you know, like whether they're gonna be kind of happy and healthy more generally speaking. Um, and so I think that the left needs to find ways of engaging with that with that view. We shouldn't ignore things around, say, social inequality. That That is an important part of what we're saying and how we understand the world. But we need to keep on linking it back to people's lived experiences and their lives, why, that, why it's going wrong, why people are struggling, why people are feeling so precarious and you know, their mental health is collapsing and sort of, you know, they're not really seeing their friends anymore and they don't like work, you know, like the actual experience that so many people have under capitalism. Um, and, you know, in understanding where people are coming from and then thinking about responses, political responses to that and how people can organize. So like there's things that, you know, the left doesn't necessarily think about, you know, but I mentioned it before, like, like the mental health crisis. Um, how can we, really understand that and how can we begin to organize around that because the mental health crisis is actually debilitating to left organizing i mean i know so many people on the left who they're really depressed you know they're really sort of struggling um and they want to be active they want to do good things and try and fight for a better world but you know they just feel like they can't or they feel hopeless they feel pointless and so again like a narrative of hope is very important things can change things will change and self-activity is the key thing. People being organised to make it change is 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 what will make it happen. But also, what we like, what can we do in terms of workplace organisation around mental health issues? What can we do about you know the urban space? You know, sort of um, um, like people's concern over you know crime or, or you know like anything like that. Like, so I think all of these need to be sort of factored in. And again, obviously, you know, I don't have sort of you know just like a one sentence answer to the question of narrative but i'm just trying to say that you know we need to think about the different levels of struggle the different problems that people are going through and be able to identify means of resistance because that's what you will build campaigns around whilst constantly linking it to how we can have a different world um so it's not just say save the nhs and this is one of the problems that Mark Fisher talks about in Capitalist Realism. We're constantly fighting defensive struggles. You know, the left comes across as the conservatives because mm. we're the ones who are saying, stop this, don't do that, protect this, you know. Um, and that's because we are trying to defend the gains of, you know, post-war social democracy, like the NHS, for instance. Um, but we need to do more than that. We can't just articulate things. That, sorry, I, I, like I'm using the word articulate, it's really annoying. Um, uh, we can't just sort of phrase things as these kind of uh, constant defensive struggles. It has to be that sort of systemic critique of capitalism, which is also looking to a different way of organizing life. I and mean, people talk about prefigurative politics. Um, doesn't mean everyone has to go and live in a squat and not be exploited. Um, but how can we try and prefigure the politics of the future in the struggles that we're waging now? How can we at least think about those things? Um, and I think that explosion of the political imagination um, to be able to get out of the humdrum, depressing existence that we're in at the moment, that's gonna be crucial. Like that's gonna make the difference. Okay. Okay, sh shall, I, shall I come in on a couple of other things, uh, Judy? And um, maybe, um, sure. I'm, looking, I'm looking at the time, maybe if I, I'll make this, I could perhaps make this my summing up as well. Um, if I pick up a couple of questions and then Simon might sort of clear up on any others that we, we've not covered. Because I mean, I've got a sort of number of connected things really to say in response to different questions that have come in. Um, I mean, the, the, the first thing to really emphasize, which, which relates to a lot of the questions and the comments actually, um, and it's echoing something that Simon has already said, is that we have to, we have to create a revolutionary poll of people who will not accommodate 
to uh, forces that are pulling us to the right. We, we have to have that. We have to have the poll that says we're not going to move to the right with Starmer in an attempt to win votes from uh, racist uh, workers. Uh, we're not going to um, adjust uh, our politics to enable us to continue to function as some kind of left in the Labour Party when the Labour left is clearly disintegrating. We're not going to accommodate to the anti-union laws imposed upon us. We're not going to accept the bill that the Tories are currently passing through. We're going to actively defy it. Um, we actually have to have uh, a, a kind of revolutionary poll that has that very, very firm position. However, um, however weak we might be initially, and I want to use an historical example in relation to this. You see, in 1914, when the German Social Democratic Party collapsed into support for the First World War, and indeed when virtually the whole of the international socialist movement collapsed into support for their respective national governments when the First World War broke out, the revolutionaries who stood against that in most places were a tiny, tiny minority. This was an absolutely catastrophic uh, human disaster created by the system. And in Rosa Luxemburg's flat in Berlin, the revolutionaries who were opposed to what had happened, opposed to their own party voting for the war, in effect, they are about a dozen of them. About a dozen of them. Four years later, the German Revolution is led by those people. Now, my point is that if the crisis of the system is deep enough, if there are a whole series of social explosions because of the ecological crisis, because of the inequality, because of the police racism, because of all of the things that they're doing uh, to us, if you have a firm, clear, principled revolutionary poll, you can begin to win people to that through the mass struggles um, that um, are going on. What form will the revolution itself take? What form will the movement towards revolution take? Well, you can't second guess it. You can't predict it. You can say you need a principal uh, revolutionary organization that isn't going to budge. Um, that basically is going to stand up for the interests of working people and the oppressed on a global scale. But you can't predict the form the struggle is going to take. Again, a historical example is that, is that when the Soviets, the, the, the mass workers' councils first appeared, that were the, going to be the driving force of the Russian Revolution, when they first appeared on the historical stage in 1905, Lenin said, what's this got to do with us? We want everybody to join the party, not create workers' councils. They didn't understand, the Bolsheviks, you know, didn't understand what these things were. I mean, how stupid was that when you look at what then unfolds? Is Lenin relevant? Yes, he is. Is Trotsky relevant? Yes, he is. But relevant because, in fact, they are the representatives in 1917 of that un uh, uncompromising revolutionary stand that eventually pulls a majority of the Russian working class into support for the revolution, a revolution which is embodied in mass participatory democracy. And it's worth saying, what is the very essence of revolution? Red-green revolution, because that's the kind of revolution we need now, a social revolution and an ecological revolution. What's the very essence of it? It is mass participatory democracy. All of those idiots who are supporting China, the Chinese Stalinist dictatorship, as they smash democracy in Hong Kong, and as they set up concentration camps for the Uyghurs um, in Western China, those Stalinist idiots who think they're part of the left, they are not part of the left, because absolutely fundamental, fundamental to any kind of serious pro uh, project for radical social change is that what you're doing is you're seeking to empower the mass of the people at the base and turn them into a democratic force, a democratically organized force with the power to dispossess the corporations and to break the uh, back of the repressive states that support um, the corporations. But there isn't a blueprint. We, we know 
We know that we have to create forms of mass participatory democracy. We know that we have those become the way in which you mobilize huge numbers of people into a, revolu into a revolutionary movement, but we can't second guess the exact form which is going to take. What revolutionaries have to do is embed themselves in that movement from below. And I'll give you a, a, a finish with this because it makes the point well. And I know Dora's asked a question about, um, you know, this contradiction there is between structurelessness on the one hand and the sclerosis of existing organizations on the other. And Dan has also, you know, made reference to the problem of the you know of the uselessness of the existing trade union leaders because they allow themselves to be shackled by the anti-union laws the job of revolutionaries is to begin to group themselves into an organization and encourage others to join the organization that organization needs to be very democratic and inclusive not these horrible little top-down sects like the SWP has morphed into, for example. It needs to be much more democratic and bottom-up and inclusive and so on. But you're grouping people around uncompromising uh, revolutionary politics and then immersing yourself in the movement. Now, in relation to Kill the Bill, I can tell you on Monday night, there was a fantastic meeting on Monday night attended by about 150 people all of them representing different organizations are coming together and lots and lots of different campaigns organized essentially by Sisters Uncut and Black Lives Matter. All revolutionaries should be involved in that, not trying to control it, not trying to manipulate it, but immersed in that movement, that youth revolt. There's a big day of action being planned on the 1st of May, and I think it could be absolutely huge, um, actually. The job of revolutionaries is to be centrally involved in building that, centrally involved in the protests on the day, but also within it, putting a radical set of politics and saying, you know, this is why the police behave in this way. This is why the Tories are trying to create this kind of uh, repression. This is all embedded in the crisis of the system. It's linked with the ecological crisis and the social crisis. And you're trying to build people's understanding who are getting involved in the action and draw them into a revolutionary movement without trying to manipulate it, without trying to control it from above, doing it by persuasion, doing it uh, uh, from below and doing it without having any clear blueprint as to what various stages of the struggle are going to be because you can't guess it and that I think Dan is how we'll smash the anti-union laws actually it'll be done from below it won't be done by the trade union leaders aren't going to lead anything worthwhile what will happen I think is we'll get at some point movements on the street that are so powerful that workers begin to say well we're not going to actually we're just going to walk out and you begin to get a kind of regeneration of rank and file trade unionism um, at that level. Okay. okay, okay, we've got four minutes left. Simon Hanna, do you want to make some final statements? Along four scene? minutes, okay, great. Um, I'll, 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 I'll try and be quick. Uh, first of all, um, thank you to Simon P in the um, questions who called us two of the left's top political theorists. Simon, I will give you that five pound note uh, <laughs> next time I see you. Thank you, that's great. Um, uh, there's been lots of great questions in the chat. I've, I've uh, written what I think in responses to some of them on there. Um, um, I don't have time to go through all of them. Um, I guess, I mean, Steph has asked the sort of $64 million question, which is the kind of like, how can we win question? Um, I recommend people read the book. You might not agree with all of it. I mean, I don't actually, you know, particularly agree with every single dot and comma in it, but um, me and Neil uh, and the organization that we're in, Anti-Capitalist Resistance, we are, you know, trying to build a more broad and plural revolutionary organization where, yeah, I mean, you know, like you can have differences over, you know, political points and so on. Um, but we, you know, where possible, we're trying to agree on strategy um, and the general kind of move forward. And I think that kind of links in with some of the questions about, you know, the unions or sort of, whether you should be in a broad left party or you should have been in Labour under Corbyn. Um, the important thing is to be flexible, but principled. Um, and the important thing is to realise that most of these things are tactics. You know, um, it's, not, it's not a principle that you have to be in the Labour Party. I know some people think it is. I don't think it is. Um, indeed, in, in anti-capitalist resistance, some of us are active in Labour because we're in very good CLPs and, you know, they're left wing and 
you know, they're involved in networks, you know, of activists. That's great. Other people are in parts of the country, you know, where it's not so good and, you know, like there's not much point. So I think, you know, like these are tactical considerations. Um, and the important thing is to build a, a healthy revolutionary left where there is a comradely culture of disagreement, um, but there is unity wherever possible. Um, and you don't split constantly over tactical disagreements, you know, sort of like, you know, should you vote Labour at the next election or not? You know, that is not a, that is not for us like a split question. Like, you know, like that is, you know, um, uh, it's important to talk about these things and have like a point of view, um, but we need to move away from some of those old kind of more sect uh, methods of organising. So I think we need to make the left a bit more of a, well, like we need to make sure people want to join the left. You know, you're not going to join the left against some head banging row over, you know, this or that like little thing. I mean, it should be something which is, you know, joyful if possible, but obviously we're working under very difficult conditions at the time. So it like, it should at least not be, you know, a traumatic experience. It should be one where, you know, each individual's talents and skills can be built up by the collective that they're in and they can feel kind of empowered to be active and, you know, and campaigning. So like in terms of strategies, I mean, you know, uh, as, as this is the final thing I'll say, because I've only got 30 seconds left. I mean, uh, in the book, we outline some, some, you know, points that we want to make. We are in favor of mass action. Um, we are increasingly seeing, say, you know, BLM in the United States is raising the demand to defund the police. That is a radical demand, which goes right to the heart of the nature of the capitalist state. In Britain, we've got the Kill the Bill Coalition. You know, that is a radical movement, which is fighting against the encroaching kind of authoritarian capitalist police state in Britain. I'm not saying that's what we have now, but that's clearly the direction, you know, that things are going in. These are movements which are raising all kinds of questions about capitalism, about social rights, social reproduction, political rights. Um, and so being able, you know, not having a sectarian view towards those movements, being involved in them, but trying to put forward a clear radical argument as much as possible. So, for instance, we're involved in the coalition to, you know, to kill the bill, um, but we are also campaigning uh, in a new initiative called, Demo uh, called Democracy Unchained, where we're talking about the more general political points, it's not just the police bill in Parliament, it, that, you know, there's a more um, systemic attack on democracy going on in Britain and elsewhere, driven by the needs of the capitalist class. Um, and so being able to kind of draw those threads together into a campaign which can help mobilize people to achieve changes, um, that is important, like, like uh, that's very important. Um, but yeah, um, and like in terms of those other kind of questions, uh, read the book, you can get it from Housemans. <laughs> okay, we're out of time. So thanks to everyone who attended. Thanks for the excellent questions. Sorry we didn't have time to answer all of them. And thanks to the great speakers. And read the book. Read the book.